post-crash, we see sometimes via regulator encouragement, so it's a bit of a paradox. They encourage you to do secured funding, but at the same time, they don't like it if it's too much as incumbent. <laughs> so, so you've got like one, you go, you're walking along a corridor. Um, I've got another good anecdote about this one as well, actually. You're walking along the corridor and there's one office and they said, do more secured funding. Fine, no problem. And you're just as you're, at, you're walking out that door, a guy across the opposite the corridor in the same building, same department, same regulator, says, can you come in here a second? I don't like this encumbrance. So you see what I mean? It's a, it's a bit of a paradoxical situation. A very, a non-jokey one is to do with CSAs in derivatives markets. So we're off, we're off on a tangent, tangent here for a second, but it's, 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 it's worthwhile. So banks, central banks, regulators, obviously want as much derivatives trading to be collateralized as possible. Hence the requirement now for centralized clearing counterparties. Now that's not on stream yet, but I reckon the CCCP, the old Soviet Union, and there's some connection there, the centralized clearing counterparty potentially creates some negative unintended consequences, which we could articulate if we were not on this course. That's a conversation for separate, separate for another time. But obviously, the CCP has arisen out of the crash. The, the, C, the CCCP, the Centralised Clearing Counterparty, has arisen as a requirement out of the crash, a regulatory requirement. The whole world, well, the regulators all think it's a great thing from Basel downwards, from, from Dodd-Frank, Volcker rule, what have you. All these regulators downwards think it's a good idea. So obviously, collateralising derivatives transactions is good. If that's the case, can someone tell me why a lot of developed world central banks will only sign one-way CSAs. Can someone tell me that? If collateralizing your derivatives portfolio is good, and they, they must be because they want us to sign up to, C well, we have to sign up to CCCPs, then why is it that one of the biggest guilty parties of people who will not collateralize their derivatives trades are developed country, Western country central banks? So this is my walking down the corridor regulator thing that I just had a joke about with, with, with regard to secured funding and encumbrance. Here, I'm walking down the corridor and the one guy in the central bank says, you must CSA, collateralize all your derivatives, no problem. And then as I walk out that door, someone else hails me and says, but I'm not doing my derivatives under a CSA. Is that all right? You see what I mean? So there's a bit of a paradox there as well. Similarly for encumbrance. So we'll go back on stream now, back on task, back on focus. A greater share of secured funding will raise the level of encumbrance on your balance sheet, okay? So, and there will be limits. Um, now I've put there for W and G, and for the purposes of this lecture, let's just ignore who that is. <laughs> I didn't edit that slide. The regulator PRA limit, that's because of my own personal experience where I've had conversations with the regulator, so I know, that's how I know about this explicitly. The, in the UK, the regulator has an informal limit that I'm, and that's, I'm quoting, that's in inverted commas, that's in quotation marks, precisely because that's what I was told. They have an informal stated limit approaching 20%. If it's over 20%, capital add-ons may start to apply, okay? I've mentioned the credit rating agencies impact on one notch once it becomes high, but they don't state what high is. Or, and or an outlier to peers. So if you're an outlier, so if all your peers are at 20% encumbrance and you're at 35, that's also potentially an issue. So therefore, it's worth having a policy on encumbrance for governance reasons, but also to understand, also to assist understanding the balance sheet impact, okay? So here is an illustration of gross and net issues as well. In other words, you don't just have the limit, that's fine, everyone can have a limit work to it. You need to understand the impact on your balance sheet of certain funding structures. Two examples. Uh, RMBS and covered bond. So with the RMBS, I've got 30 billion notional. I actually raise 20 billion because of over collateralization and retained notes. So I've got a gross encumbrance of 30 billion today on the balance sheet, but I've only raised 20 billion of funding. Do you see what I mean? From an encumbrance point of view, I've encumbered more of the balance sheet than I've actually got funding for. This is just a stylized example. It might not be 10 billion, it could be 10 million. <laughs> you see my point though. You need to understand the impact on the encumbrance limit, if you have a limit, and you, you will need a limit at some point, informally or not, through a, an issuance vehicle that has an element of over collateralization and also um, retained notes, okay? So you're actually encumbering more in this particular stylized example than you're actually getting funding for. So you need to be aware of this.